uh, I am the moderator, and which um, I took to mean I was going to let the chair uh, do the introductions. Um, but it turns out that this panel is becoming kind of a rock star panel, where we get to uh, feature and talk about a rock star or professor, Julie leninger Pissior's work, and have that sort of um, um, comment. Now, <coughs> because we have the opportunity to sort of like uh, share Dr. leninger Pissior's work, what I thought I would do is actually break the fourth wall and turn this not from a conference where we have the microphone um, and you are the audience, uh, where we actually try to bring the audience in. So I'd like to introduce myself. I'm John McEwen Gonzalez. I am um, a father, an author, a historian, and a fan. Um, and I teach at Texas State University. And I'd like you to just say, um, something about yourselves, your name, maybe your institution, and what you like doing. So I'd like to start with the uh, woman with the computer in the corner there. Hi, I'm uh, Ashley Benya. I'm an attorney, and I'm actually uh, also a student at the College of Education um, in the EPP program, Education Policy and Planning. Great. I'm Margo Gutierrez. I'm a librarian just over there at the Benson Latin American Collection. And, uh, I've been doing the Latino Latina studies uh, for 28 years, and uh, what I like doing is listening to Julie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Melissa Benigno. I'm a retired teacher, 27 years of teaching bilingual at the George Sanchez Elementary. So now I feel like I have to be there for the Buddhist workforce because of everything they're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm Marilena Martinez, uh, also a retired bilingual educator. Yeah, and you also were involved in Rasa Nida, I understand. Making history in the early years, yeah. but we've been introducing ourselves. <laughs> so, so I'm really sorry that you came in. But I, I'm John McKinney Gonzalez. I uh, research history and teach history at Texas State University. And this is Julie leninger Pissior and we're big fans. And you are? Uh, Sammy Martinez, uh, UT, uh, MOS, and Journalism State. OK. Um, Dr. Pissior. Sorry, I'm in Texas. Professor Pissior. Uh, <laughs> Julie's fine. Uh, or Julie, as <laughs> her friends know her. Um, we'll be presenting on oral history and the history of Mexican-American activism, reflections for decades in the field. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, it's such an honor and a, a pleasure to be here. Um, this is just like coming home. It's the, the head, you know. We, we think about all these things in the heart. We have a, like... Um, uh, community, so it's just great uh, to be here. Um, when Maggie uh, st uh, told me about this conference, and, she, and I read about it, and she said she was encouraging papers related to oral history, um, it 
And she said there's going to be this new journal of Latina, Latino oral history. Uh, that inspired me to look back at oral history. And here I, I see Margot I, I, and really jump in. Um, I, I do know you have to leave to our meeting, but um, if we have time, um, I'd like you to jump in and talk about the oral history you've done. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience in the field and the um, and that this is a appropriate for a historian, right? Looking back, um, and I'm going to spotlight the generation of practitioners that published books about Mexican American history, especially activism, before 2000 using oral history. Okay, so books before 2000 using oral history on Mexican Americans topics, particularly activism. Um, well, here we're talking mostly mostly about the baby boomer generation <laughs> who uh, um, came into historical studies in the period of the Vietnam War, Chicano Chicana movement, um, and who were determined to rectify the situation that was in academe at that time, where uh, the first history conference I ever went, first major history conference I ever went to, as you know, there are two history, big, big history associations. And one is the Organization of American Historians for people who do U.S. history. Well, historians never throw anything away. So here's my program from the 1976 OAH. Okay, guess how many panels had anything to do with the history of Latinas or Latinos? You know the answer, right? So we were fired up to try and rectify this situation. So you could say in a way that activism was at the core of this generation's scholarly endeavors, the historians, the archivists, and other uh, uh, scholars. Uh, now, when I look back on, on some of the first books from that generation, one, one that comes to mind is Albert Camarillo's groundbreaking 1976, 1976 book, Chicanos in a Changing Society, where he interviewed almost 30 people about their community's history in Santa Barbara. Um, he felt the necess necessity of having an index, a methodological index, where he explained the importance of Chicano oral historical research and filling in the gaps of 20th century Chicano history, the dearth of traditional sources, um, the need for quantifiable data and oral history. And you'd say, well, yeah, duh. I mean, everybody uses quantifiable data, but everybody does oral history if it's a period where we still have people around. But he pointed out that some, um, he pointed out that some practitioners at the time thought that oral history was like supplemental or, or not, not, a, not, not, not another important source. Um, and so he felt like he had to say, this is important. If Sometimes you can't get the information any other way. Um, and he, uh, and so you have the subject is considered marginal and the method is considered marginal, right? So he had a double um, a reason to be animated to do it. Um, so he was one example. Another example was a 1983 book by Ricardo Romo, uh, using oral history interviews to inform his, it was the first ever history of East LA. Okay, such an important topic. Um, you also have uh, James B. Lane and Edward Escobar, who chronicled the history of Mexican American communities in Northwest Indiana. And it, I, I love the title, Forging a Community. You can feel the activism under the surface there. Um, and obviously, um, in the subsequent decades, the historical profession went well beyond its, a, this focus, right? Um, in 
2013, the Organization of American Historians president, anybody know? Was Al Camarillo. <laughs> um, and of course, Ricardo Romo went on to be president of UTSA in 1999, where he still is, right? Um, or take the main historical group, the uh, Association of American Historians, right? The big group, like, like MLA, like ABA. And uh, the president of the American Historical Association this year? Vicki Ruiz. Vicki Ruiz, right. You want to show her? Oh, you got her up there. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, where she's getting the, um, and here she's getting the um, uh, National Endowment for the Humanities Award from President Obama. Um, and, I'm sorry, the National Humanities Medal from President Obama. Uh, and of course, she's emblematic of the trailblazing historians of this generation, <clears throat> the baby boomers. <laughs> um, uh, now, many of you are probably tired of hearing about that, and so in the discussion, you can bring that up, <laughs> us talking about ourselves. Um, she's a doubly a pioneer, right, as a Latina, doing Latina history. And in her first book, her 1987 book, Cannery Women, Cannery Lives, she said, as a historian, I've chosen oral history interviews as the primary means by which to examine a cross-section of Mexican women wage earners in food processing. Um, mostly these were her own interviews, but she also, by 87, there were other interviews she could draw from. And together, these interviews afforded, in her words, a far more complex picture of labor organizing. And she pointed out that labor activism, that these women were um, influencing labor history as well as women's history. And previously, labor historians, who to their credit had brought in working class people, nonetheless, had shown uh, the uh, women, the Chicanas in California, as not as players. And of course, uh, uh, Ruiz was showing them as very important players in the organizing. And then in 1998 came her monumental work, From Out of the Shadows, Mexican-American Women in 20th Century America. As you know, the first ever history of the largest uh, cohort of women in the nation's largest immigrant group and in the nation's largest minority group. I mean, sort of an important topic, right? Um, and now, okay, so she's doing this history, this gigantic topic, it's an overview, people use it as textbooks, so you think, well, she's gonna be using secondary sources. Well, even here, she's using, she's needing to do, and she's, because she's a good historian, using primary sources as well, including a number of oral history interviews, uh, mostly done by her. Uh, and again, it's not an overtly activist theme, but it's in the zeitgeist of the story. Uh, capturing the saga of women navigating unequal power relationships and showcasing the work of such important figures. So, so women, numbers of women organizing at the grassroots, but also specific women. It's so like I say to my students, you know, what, who are important in history? Well, what are the important topics? I'm sorry, let me reframe. What are the important topics in history? I mean, one important topic is if it's done by a lot of people and or affects a lot of people. And the other one, the more traditional one is, if you have certain people that rise up and because of their power and their charism and their initiative for good or ill, affect history. And Vicki Reese did both in this book, right? She also had the second characteristic of these important people, people like Luisa Moreno, Josefina Fierro, Emma Tenayuca, um, and actually, I understand that her next book is a biography of um, Luisa Moreno. So, and we have, no, uh, Margo and I were talking about this. I believe 
there are no, correct me, I hope I'm wrong, freestanding, full-scale, not a single full-scale biography of a Latina, period. I looked up Dolores Huerta. There are a couple juvenile biographies. So I understand somebody's working on a biography of Dolores Huerta. I don't think it's a biography per se. It's more an, a, a communicate, from the communications perspective, mm -hmm. what was her impact. So they're looking into their, um, her uh, correspondence with Cesar Chavez, for example, mm -hmm. and, you know, and other aspects. Um, that's one paper that she published, but now she's working on a whole book. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a, a full-scale biography. On the, on, the, on the one hand, on the other hand, it is the biographical frame, which is uh, we need that too for sure. Yeah, and the author is Stacy Sowers. Um, she's uh, UT El Paso. Mm. Okay, thank. Okay, thanks, Lourdes. Um But yeah, we, it's 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 really. Criminal um, and Vicky Ruiz is forging away, forging her way in that. She's going to evidently do a full-scale biography of Luisa Moreno. Um, other books from that generation that used oral history. Uh, an important one is uh, Mario T. Garcia's Mexican Americans' Leadership, Ideology, and Identity. Uh, there's been a, when he lays out the Mexican American generation, kind of the GI. World War II generation, there's been a lot of historiographical debate about that frame since then, but it certainly is an important, important book. But the part with that relates to oral history, most importantly, it seems to me, in that book, is the, is not the, the, the GI generation that came back, but rather where he talks about an organization from the mid 20th century that was a trailblazing radical association, as you know, ANMA's Alianza Nacional Mexico Americana, where he interviewed some of the people who uh, were still alive in the, uh, in the late 80s. From that organization, many of these trailblazing radical organizers were uh, women. Um, as you know, one way that they were so important was talking about immigrant rights and labor rights connected. And then we lose a lot of that in the 50s with the Red Scare, where these women were hounded back to, back to Mexico, or they from Mexico, or, or um, jailed and so forth here. Um, you have little, little half-life of that story in the 50s, uh, which I'll get to later. But... Um, at any rate, his book was the first to use interviews with them to um, um, tell part of tell that story. Um, other important books published before two thousand, whose his other books published before two thousand, whose oral history components contributed to the history of Mexican American activism, include uh, Carl Alsop. Carol Alsop's 1982 American GI Forum, and Zaragoza Vargas's books on Mexican American workers, uh, starting with his 1993 Proletarians of the North, a history of Mexican industrial workers in Detroit and the Midwest. And I don't just mention it because I'm from Michigan too, but I am proud of him. Anyway. Um, so there we were. We're out there. Oh, and I, um, uh, well, I'll get to mine in a second. But there we were out there doing the, this stuff. And what was the methodology? It was seat of the pants. The one manual, unless you correct me if I'm wrong, but was Willa K. Baum's um, Oral History for the Local Historical Society, 1969. I mean, the Oral History Association was founded three years earlier, right? I mean, we were just kind of all doing it. Um, and what did we use? <laughs> we used the cassette tape recorder, kind of bulky, you know. No, you know this, but just to wax, come back, travel, do time travel here, you know, you couldn't, you know, make. Cop you, you, to make copies was very difficult, and so you hung on to your cassette tape, and if it got mangled, 
too bad, you know. Um, you couldn't send it to your friends. You couldn't do all this digital cool stuff. Um, you certainly couldn't do a, a to do a, a, a video one was, oh, I mean, none of us did. It was so difficult. Um, on the other hand, we considered ourselves very lucky because we didn't have to do, we were so advanced, you know, we just had this little thing to carry around. We didn't have the reel-to-reel, -reel, which was like this, and or worse, the people of the previous generation who had to do it just by, you know, writing it down um, and listening and writing it down from the 30s and 40s. So we thought we were very lucky, actually. <laughs> um, the, um, and when I say we, um, it's, um, I'm talking, I, I, and I want to catch Margo before she leaves, but it, our allies were the young archivists, um, also with the same motivation to correct this exclusion in the archives and what's important in the archives. And, and we used their stuff from the archives. Um, thousands of, and then they did thousands and thousands of, of interviews themselves, and, they, and now in recent years they've put them online, the ones they did earlier, it was so cool. And I want to uh, signal um, um, Cecilia uh, um, Otto's Hunter down at ANI, Oscar Martinez at UTEP, Tom Krennic, who was at Houston Metropolitan Library and is then at AM Corpus, um, and as I put in my acknowledgments, mi verdadera compañera, um, who started the, the Mexican American uh, collection, Margot. Um, do you have time to tell a few stories? Well, I think the one story I want to tell is connected to you, Julie, because you introduced me to Eddie Dodd Jr. Oh. Oh. At, at a conference. You had met him, you had interviewed him, and he was a, an attorney of World War II vet, uh, a very conservative Mexican-American gentleman, but he was very, um, he was a gentleman, you know, de, de esa generación, he was real, muy recto, correcto, um, and somehow I asked him, uh, had the nerve to ask him for his papers because he was, he was a little stern looking, and uh, we developed a, a relationship that lasted until his death, and uh, I believe that we um, have about 80 tapes, and I think they've been digitized, I hope they have, uh, of conversations where he starts, and he came from that noted Idad family in, in, uh, in Laredo. Um, Felipe Idad, his grandfather was Nicasio Idad, the first, uh, the editor and owner of La Cronica. Um, but anyway, he uh, had very interesting experiences throughout his career. Uh, he was in that San Antonio Maldef office that Vilma Martinez was talking about. Um, <clears throat> he worked for the AG's office. He was very involved, very, very involved in the American Jai Forum. And what's so interesting is that <clears throat> there's con there are connections between him and George Sanchez, for example. He was a student of George Sanchez's. If you read um, the correspondence there, if you read Dr. Hector's correspondence in, in, uh, at Corpus, you know, these, these guys, eran pocos, pero they all worked together, they networked, they, inter you know, they, they were so influential, they were the movimiento of the time in, in the late 40s and 50s, Chris Aldrete, uh, um, so many others. Um, so it's really been a privilege uh, to, to work with these gentlemen who are deceased now. Um, and I've, I've just, there's so much to be mined in them still. Uh, they're very highly uh, utilized, but, and they're, they're just very rich. And, and uh, but the oral history component comes into in Eddie Dars and the tapes that you uh, that you gave us mm -hmm. uh, for for your book, your interviews. Yeah, and and actually, I don't know if I should say this, but you you actually bought them, and <laughs> that paid my uh, airfare to a conference, which was really nice. I mean, small. <laughs> yeah. That was a modest fee. It was just enough for the airfare. <laughs> but it's really nice to have them. Um, um, Obviously, you know, to you have your work uh, preserved and used. Um, somebody was saying, uh, Maritza, 
I was saying she wants to listen to the one I did with uh, Lupe Angiano, who, um, oh, you know, yeah, who, 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 who would, Ticana, who went on to help found um, um, National um, Women's Political Caucus and stuff. Um, and was involved with the, well, oh, was involved with the bilingual ed, right, uh, in the Johnson administration. Um, and if you think of other stories, uh, you know, well, I don't know, you have other ones you want to tell us at all about it or anything? Um, well, there's so many stories. Yeah, so yeah. Just, and I've, my, I've been enriched by meeting some of these folks and, um, you know, they're, they're treasures and they're, there's our histories there. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you say, it's wedded to the written record, too. Yes. They're, they're, they're files up in the attics, and if you guys have the files up in the attics, you know to send, have your ancianos send the stuff to the archives. We need it. Okay. Um, um, and then in the 90s, we have more collections starting. Uh, we have uh, Jose Angel Gutierrez uh, over at Arlington with the Tejano Voices. And we have, of course, Maggie, right? I mean, with the, um, with the Voces Oral History Project and what is it, more than a thousand interviews and ongoing and now the journal. And then, of course, the side thing with Ken Burns. Uh, I'm sure you all know that story when he did, what, 20 hours of grassroots GIs and, and he missed the ethnic group that had the most Medal of Honor winners? Come on. Um, and she led the charge, defend the honor on that one. Um, all right. Um, and prior to receiving her doctorate, she also conducted a lot of interviews for the first draft of history, which is journalism, right? Um, and um, uh, uh, as a reporter for the Boston Globe, but it, for our purposes, particularly important uh, as the border, she was head of the border project for the Dallas Morning News. Um, for quite a while, I don't have the dates here, but um, Julie, I just want to mention that something people don't know about very much is the NPR sort of spinoff um, from what's the program where the oral history program? Oh yeah, um, 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 story so, Yeah. So it's it's called Historias, mm. and we we um, are housing those oral histories uh, and. People can have to come in to listen to them because they're they're not ready to let go of them. But they're they're housed at the well, I guess it's it's a digital archive. But people can listen to them at, at the Benson, and uh, you know, uh, hopefully they'll they'll make it widely accessible at some point in the future where it's a website and you can do so like voices like um, like John John's uh, project. Um, John, you have to talk about your project. Well, after um, I can talk about like. Okay, well, then I'll, 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 I'll yeah. sort of, great. That'll be great. Um, and actually, with the StoryCorps, I mean, David Isay is in New York, so I'm not shy. I'll contact him and yeah. see if I can talk him into. Oh, historias, yeah. <laughs> Como? Historias. Historias, okay. Um, Which we launched, by the way, on the Capitol grounds in Washington, D.C. Uh, That's right. Yeah. With. Mm -hmm. Almost every member of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, uh, and David was uh, was a speaker along with Javier Becerra. Cool. Do you, do you want to talk about that a bit? Uh, you, no obligation, but like the first draft of history versus the second draft here, you're a, a, a premier interviewer and reporter, and your, your reflections from your perspective on what we guys do and how interactions, similarities, differences, anything? Well, I think particularly for as an author, you know, I, I'm really aware of the whole need for citations and how oral history is looked upon as, well, you're not really there yet, you know, because your your sources, it, it's difficult to provide validation for the sources oh. from an oral history perspective. Uh -huh. So I, I think the whole idea of where we are as a community, Latinos in the United States. To me, my perspective, having helped to introduce the Historias Project with the StoryCorps, was that we need as much information about our experiences as we can get. I don't care how we get it, mm. okay? 
And, and the other part is I think there's a marketing value to storytelling. I, uh, I'm involved with the living room, uh, a, group, a series of presentations that people tell stories orally uh, about their experiences. And I think that part of this process is we have to get our community comfortable with sharing their experiences that can ultimately be transposed into a written document so that we can then begin the whole idea of continuing not only our experiences, but our culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that the Oral History Project, I've worked with Maggie for the past several years on, on trying to get the, the, well, we changed from the initial name of the project was World War II, Latinos, Latinas, Oral History Project. It took you a week and a half to say that. <laughs> and, and, but, changed it and we came up with voices which was much more inclusive and I, and I think part of the whole idea is just get as much of it as possible. I have a little side note. I, I, did, a, I did a documentary series uh, in the early 70s called La Raza, uh, The oh, People, mm -hmm. which was narrated by uh, Ricardo Montalban and I was having the possibility of having it, the series, the TV series, recognized at the Santa Clara Film Festival. Mm. I couldn't find any of the projects, the programs. And uh, I sit on the UT Libraries Advisory Council. And I one day turned to, uh, to Gregory Perry and I said, Gregory, I need help. Where can I find this? And he says, go through the, the uh, internet. And we found we have two copies of the program here at UT Libraries. And uh, they haven't been digitized yet. But the whole idea is that we have to have these resources, these archives, at places where people can get to them and share them with our, the rest of the community. It's, so it's when are you bringing your papers over? Uh. Because really, yeah, I, I do have to back you up on that. We're bringing the papers in because um, people need to understand. You know, you can see have them sealed for 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 a, for a period of time. It's not a question of that. So before there's a garage sale, we hate garage sales <laughs> or house cleaning. You know, de, what do you call it um, when you're downsizing? Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah. Well, thank. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, it, anybody want to? I don't know. You have any? Sure. Uh, even though I was a student here two years, but I didn't know what, what area I wanted to go into, and then I did get started and I applied it same as. I did an anthropological study, and this to me is very much oriented in terms of the 1940s. His name was Jose Perevino. He ended up being my father in law later on, but we made a map. I didn't even know. I grew up in the projects in East Austin. The 10th Ward, I mean, I didn't even know that the first residence were European American. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that the barrio was located downtown where the Republic Square is right now, and where the Lupe Church was located there. We made a map of all the specific, you know, oh my the city. He lived right on Second Street where the Segovia still is, we call it Segovia Tortillera was with it. And then it became the Liberty Lunch mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. And right there from uh, Congress to the, I mean, there was a first street, there was no first street, it was like the junkyard. <laughs> I mean, he would, so much details, and he talked about the Tom Miller wanting to buy that area where they were gonna build the first project in the USA called the 10th Ward. I mean, and when I run into, when I run into people that I grew up with, I said, did you know that the body was, no. Anyway, this is what, where I feel like it's so important when I run into students, you need to, interview your grandparents because there's so much history there that needs to be recorded. Mm -hmm. And there's so much more I can talk about but I won't be do What happened to the map? I'm we afraid to it. I mean, oh. it was about a ten page Oh I mean, give give it to Michael. No no no. I, I am gonna turn it in. Aside from that, the Austin History Museum I already That's put right. it in there. Yeah. But oh, we need to I do need to move it on. Because <laughs> we, I find that I run into students and I always help out connection. There's other stories that I could tell you, but I'm not going to tell you right now. But this is why it was so important. And plus, 
He ended up being the main cook at St. Edward's University. They even mm -hmm. lived on the grounds of St. Edward's University, even before they had Pat Street. Yeah. So, and he even played with the orchestra sometimes, and they needed but he was a bass player. <laughs> anyway, I can go on and on, but there's so much. So much of the history of Austin yeah. that's yeah. missing, Austin. you know? Yeah. Um, um, the radical transformation of Eva. Yeah. 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 The gentrification. You it's like now we're going where? To the, yeah. To yeah. So you've got to preserve that. I know. It's important. Preserve that. Yeah, yeah. So we're all a un equipo here. We're yeah. in it together. Okay. Um, other books? Okay, great. Um, so, um, so yeah, so there's this, this intercambio with the, with the journalists. Um, and when we were starting out, a lot of us looked to journalists to help us because we didn't know anything about interviewing or anything. We hadn't been trained in methods. And one one book that helped me was, um, uh, well, I guess he was he's a radio journalist of Studs Terkel's book, A Hard Times, where he had done interviews of people from the 1930s. And just how he interviewed them and then how he put the material together helped me a lot. And um, so for the first book that I wrote, um, I used his, um, I used a quote from that. And it, re it reminds me of what you just said about stories. He said, now where is it? I build up to this. Um, so in my introduction, I quote from Studs Terkel's Hard Times introduction. And he said, this is a memory book rather than one of hard fact and precise statistic. For the people in this book, their rememberings are their truths. And he wove together all these stories, and it was so powerful. And I thought, you know, I would like to do that. So we, we turned somewhat to journalists. We also turned to, to sociologists because they're trained in interview to interview subjects. It's different, but it's at least they're trained, right? And... <coughs> I think that Al Camarillo, remember I talked about him in the beginning, 1979 book on um, Mexican Santa Barbara. <coughs> um, he, um, in his appendix, he said that his interview subjects were asked mostly the same set of questions, and I think he was talking to sociologists, which may be the downside of it, but, um, but the upside is that they, <coughs> they helped us. Uh, say. I'm a teacher, so I always have my and the <coughs> um, and the sociologist I want to salute is the well to me he's also kind of a bato loco out there Gil Cardenas he's going to be speaking tomorrow um, former head of the Center for Mexican American Studies at UT but I knew him. And he's at Notre Dame, for has been many years at Notre Dame teaching. He was head of Latino studies at Notre Dame, and he's a social prof there. But I knew him when he was a grad student. And um, as a grant, when he was your age, he founded the Centro de Estudios Chicanos de Investigaciones Sociales Incorporated at Notre Dame. And I was there. Um, we were both in Julian Samora's Mexican American Studies program. And he, um, he gave me the opportunity to write that first book, um, Chicanos in South Bend, Some Historical Narratives. He had the administrative savvy to get an ethnic heritage studies grant from the federal government to do three studies of the community in South Bend, a documentary history uh, based on um, periodical coverage of, of the Mexican community, um, a, a statistical profile, and my oral history. And he also lent me my first mini cassette recorder, which was better than the cassette recorder. <laughs> and I have Gil Cardenas to indirectly thank for the topic of my first book, first University Press book, um, LBJ and Mexican Americans, because um, when I did this, when I was doing the interviews in the community in South Bend, he hired, with this grant, he hired uh, an undergrad to transcribe him. And the undergrad's name was Virginia Espinosa. And she happened to mention that her father worked on the LBJ Ranch. And she said, you know, the ranch, the ranch isn't in Johnson City. It's in Stonewall. And she's telling me about it. And I thought, and I thought, wouldn't it be interesting 
to analyze one of the most powerful modern political figures from the vantage point of Mexican-Americans and maybe get some people in a dominant society to actually learn about some of this history. And um, so that's what I did. <laughs> um, and obviously I re relied a lot on oral histories of uh, Mexican-American political mobilization <coughs> in relation to the Johnson White House. Um, I would ask people, you know, their evolutionist policy players, and um, the big connection was Johnson and Dr. Hector P. Garcia, the American GI Forum, um, but there were other players. Um, and they had some success in getting uh, Johnson's Great Society programs to address Mexican Americans better. Um, well, there's so much you can say about this, but uh, just a reminder that more laws were passed 50 years ago this year than any other year, and each one of them was gigantic. I mean, you mentioned Head Start. I mean, this is, you know, it's limitless. It's just so many programs. And so the GI Forum put a guy, Rudy Ramos, in Washington to get, stay on these task force to make sure the Latinos were included and to try and get um, uh, uh, Latinos, hello, in the, in, on, the, on the task forces and with the programming so that somebody was on the, doing the programs who, who knew something about West Side of San Antonio or whatever. Uh, they had more success in the first part, not surprisingly, right? They had more success in getting uh, uh, the programs to increasingly address the needs of people in the Latino community than they did in getting Latinos on board in the decision-making process. Um, Joe Califano, who was the top domestic advisor for President Johnson, told me that Johnson said to him, you're from Brooklyn, you don't understand. You know, I mean, it, 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 there was this there was like a black-white binary. Whites were just starting to appreciate the needs of African Americans and the contributions. And, and, and Latinos, um, um, Johnson was among the few people in the White House who was at all uh, uh, conscious of that. So they did not get into, there was a walkout in 1966. Uh, and this is in the written record, but I also got it through oral histories of people like Albert Pena, um, who, who uh, uh, Anyway, um, uh, Judge Pena, who would be, become a judge later in San Antonio, um, and that they walked out of an Equal Employment Opportunities Commission meeting because the equal employment issues of Latinos weren't being addressed. So these walkouts, uh, Johnson had them to a meeting at the White House, and these walkouts did get the attention of the White House in, by 67 particularly because it's 1967, and 1968 is an election year, right? So um, uh, those are the things that animated Johnson. You know, I don't want to overplay how interested he was in Latinos. He was interested in Johnson, right, mostly. Uh, but he, he did, ha he was a complicated guy. Uh, he ha he, so he had the altruism and the, but the power was the main thing. So the pressure and the election did get them some um, uh, appointments by uh, 67. Uh, particularly uh, the um, uh, 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 Vicente Jimenez as the head of a new cabinet uh, committee on Mexican-American affairs. Um, people always say he was from New Mexico he lived in New Mexico, but of course he was from Texas. He had been a lieutenant of Dr. Hector's. That was not a coincidence, right, that Johnson would pick somebody who was close to Dr. Hector Garcia and GA form. Um, I talk, the subtitle of this is The Paradox of Texas History. Uh, the, um, and, and here your story comes, starts to come in, you know, with Raza Unida, with, 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 with the activism, the blowouts and the walkouts in 68 and, uh, um, and um, the people I interviewed and the, and the written record to some extent show 
that Latinos influenced that race. I mean, you think about it. LBJ announces his, he, not his resignation. I always tell my students, he didn't resign. He quit the race. He withdrew from the race, May 31st, 1968. You know, this man whose whole life is politics and everything. Um, withdrew from the race. Why? Because the numbers weren't there. The first thing in politics is the ability to count. And you've got this right, that his, his, his numbers are tanking. Um, and he has a big threat with somebody who has name recognition, political experience, money, and that's Bobby Kennedy. Now, Bobby Kennedy had been debating on entering the race. Most of his top advisors said you shouldn't enter the race. You're going to be a spoiler. The Democrats are going to hate it. We have a sitting president. You're going to lose. And you have a reputation of being ruthless anyway, even though it's on. So don't run. His younger advisors were saying, we run. So he's sitting there. He's torn. He's torn. He's torn. And people say that one of, if not the final thing that tipped him over to run was his experience with the farmer group movement in, Calif uh, in, in, in general, but in California in particular, and with Cesar Chavez in particular. And so that tips Kennedy into running, and that tips Johnson into withdrawing. So um, these people, you know, who, it, it, who were not considered historically important, uh, I shouldn't say these people, but the Latinos, Mexican-Americans, not considered historically important. And the, or, I, one oral history interview I did with Bert Corona from Mexican American Political Association describes uh, what it was like to be next to Bobby Kennedy campaigning in California, and then what it was like, um, and then day after the election, what it was like to go back to the office to, to, to pick up the stuff, and there's nothing left. Everybody in the neighborhood had taken every little button, every little thing. And then what it was like when, 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 um, when Kennedy was assassinated. Um, so this is very much, I'm looking at you guys with Russell Nita, which is a whole other segment of the story where we're not taking for granted the two-party system. But since this is LBJ and it ends in 69, you know, this, other people have done oral histories since then, uh, have done books on Rasonia uh, with oral history. Um, they haven't, um, they should have interviewed you, but uh, at least we do have books since 2000 on that part of the uh, Latino engagement story. Um, now, my, my latest book, is in 2014, so I can't talk about it, right? But it's one of my kids, so I have figured out a way to talk about it, which is that some of the interviews for this book, I'm looking at you guys, I don't care. I, um, I were from 1976, <laughs> you know, what can I say? Uh, for my dissertation. So, um, uh, so it fits, because I was doing the first among the first oral history interviews I did were in 1976 for the, the dissertation, which led to, uh, which was a study of mutualista, mutual aid organizations in San Antonio from 1914 to 1931. And then recently I opened it up to make it national and to bring it up to today, actually. Um, so um, I, um, I'll just do a little snippet from 1976 and then do an example from more recently. Um, I interviewed um, some of the last people who were around who had been involved with the Mutualista movement. And one of them, uh, Lucas Garza, was involved with Sociedad de la Unión, which was the largest, in my understanding, the largest mutualista group in San Antonio when San Antonio was the largest Hispanic city in the country. We were used to LA, but LA isn't the focus. San Antonio is the focus until around 1945. 
and the biggest mutualist group was Sociedad de la Unión. And um, he was, was typical of a lot of the guys who joined, um, you know, uh, he was he was from the working class. He was a railroad worker. He um, uh, he went up to Chicago. He joined the American Federation of Labor, which is interesting because in many ways the American Federation of Labor was racist at that time. But but here's this guy, Lucas Garza, who's able to navigate it and become get the benefits of joining this elite union um, in 1920. Okay. He ended up coming back, having to come back to Texas because of a family emergency, um, but joined La Union uh, and felt a lot of solidarity in it in the, at a time when the situation for Mexicanos in San Antonio and in Texas in general, as you know, was very dire. Um, the... So it's in, in, in more recently, uh, obviously, I've, um, well, actually, let me mention one more thing with Lucas Garza. And that is, Margo was talking about the collections, and you know how the, uh, and, and you're talking about backing up sources with written records. And uh, so thanks to Lucas Garza, I got the minute books for this organization. I, 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 I went to see him. I looked them up in the phone book, there they were. Uh, and, <clears throat> and, and he says, oh, yeah. I said, do you have a Libros de Actas? He says, oh, yeah. And he goes, he gets a ladder, and there's a shelf up above the men's bathroom in their little meeting, meeting sort of uh, house, small house, in, on the west side of San Antonio, on East Commerce, West Commerce. And he's pulling down, you know, these old binder, these old books. You know, they're um, like ledger books. They're the black with the maroon corners and in this painstaking writing from 1885 to like 1940. There they are. And he says, oh, you know, when they put the highway through and we had to move, we almost threw them out. So, you know, it's just like, yeah, this is constant. And also the highway going through, the power dynamics, right? It doesn't go through Alamo Heights, right? It goes through where they were. So just the marriage of the, of the written records and the interviews. Um, I believe they're at um, I believe the Lake Archives, so they're okay, they're safe, in case another highway comes through. Um, so finally, um, um, uh, I, I did update, obviously for 2014, I updated the material and I can stand on the shoulders of so many people, um, but in updating the material, I, I used a lot of the archival stuff, both oral history and written, that, I, that we've talked about. But I also conducted 24 new interviews. And uh, for example, um, uh, Soled Soledad Chole a la Torre, any of you know about her? She was uh, um, very active in California in labor and immigrant rights. And I talked about how this is, this is, you have to follow me here. I had mentioned Asociación Nacional Mexicano-Americana in the late 1940s that was organizing labor immigrant rights and got red baited in the 50s. Well, there were a few people who were still doing that kind of thing at a time when, unfortunately, groups like the GI Forum and LULAC were. <clears throat> not, not, not great on immigration for, 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 because liberals were not great on immigration. Um, 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 labor and, and NAACP and ACLU didn't understand labor rights and, 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 and immigrant rights together. There were only a few people who were, despite the red baiting, keeping on, and one of them was Jule Alatorre. And she worked with Burke Corona. In, in the 50s and 60s, and, uh, and then in the 70s, they will, uh, they will create uh, one of the trailblazing organizations of um, um, immigrant rights. But, in the <clears throat> but uh, here she is, obviously, with Chavez, um, uh, conducting labor rights and immigrant rights. And they helped convince Chavez to shift his views on um, immigration policy as well. Um, and she also, so she did labor rights, 
immigrant rights and also community organizing. Uh, what she's been involved with more recently, in addition, is uh, community organizing. She's she's very important in One LA. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's the you know, you, you have cops in San Antonio, you have a Piso in El Paso, and you have one LA out in Los Angeles, the um, community organizing networks of Ernie Cortez and so forth. Um, if you could switch that, please. <clears throat> um, and so uh, she's still at it, <laughs> um, uh, trying to mobilize the, the barrios. She still lives in the barrio in Pacoima in LA, uh, where the, she told me, where the mutualistas were active way back when, and she talks about this idea of pooling your resources and relying on each other, relying on your own money, so you don't have to be dependent. You can get grants, you know, one LA gets grants, but it also gets the dues so that you can be, uh, you know, re relying on each other and be more independent. Um, so, um, so yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, this has been really amazing, and I get to talk about all this stuff. Uh, so uh, uh, now we we are, are just 2014, 2015, and I see all the, the young scholars here. It's so exciting. You guys are. Um, uh, we stand on your shoulders because what we were, we were. Um, my dissertation director said that we were. Uh, uh, archaeologists. We're just finding his stuff, right? We're finding, oh, I found this stuff and we're doing it. There's not the interpretive frame. Uh, well, I mean, we cared somewhat about, you know, about gender issues and about religion and about transnational. We cared about those things, but we weren't there yet. It's later scholars that have brought up all these other things much more um, for us. And uh, you guys will take us in uh, in all sorts of directions, but I know you'll be probably doing oral history as part of it, right? So, so thanks for coming. <laughs> so now we'll do uh, more. Uh, uh, oh, I I'm sorry, why don't you talk about your... Oh, uh, well, one thing to me that oral history can do, that sort of like looking at the paper record cannot do, is that of course, Oral history precedes the paper record. People sort of like have thoughts, people have conversations, they make it on the record. So when you're doing, say, um, biography, oral histories that are biographical in nature, um, you fill in the spaces that the paper cannot fill in. They can tell you sort of like more things that are there. Um, I'm lucky to be married to Carrie Cordova, who when she interviews artists, she spends two days with artists first getting the biography and then going work by work with the artists. And that's the kind of attention that I think needs to be done when you're doing interviews with sort of like um, people who've been, have professions to sort of like run through the different things that they've done over time after they've told you your life so you can get more of a widespread reflection. Now, uh, Julie wanted me to talk about my uh, project that, Ma that Marco mentioned. Um, <coughs> I came into oral history I'm a, I do the late 19th century, early 20th century, up to the 1940s of my work. But my other hat, I did oral histories with students, with um, junior high school students interviewing their grandparents about what it was they were doing or what their parents were doing, and then trying to think about what was of value um, in these stories to thinking about uh, histories of Tampa, histories of migration, um, and then how boys and girls, working class boys and girls, told different stories about their parents than, let's say, middle class stories, or people want to tell stories in the neighborhood. It's a very different vision of what life is like, much more, as you know from, from all the kids, is that it's about adventures and things achieved, and sort of like peace, and then another adventure, and then peace. Um, the project I did with uh, the Benson and with student funds was digitizing and this is one of the things that I think um, Mr. Asada can all talk about, is there's a question of intellectual property. <laughs> um, Meg, um, Margo and the Benson had all the reel-to-reel -reel tapes of the first uh, Latino USA version, which was the Mexican-American experience. Um, and if they were on reel-to-reel -reel tapes, and if they were played, they would get destroyed. Sort of like uh, Mission Impossible, you know, this this. Uh, this recording will self-destruct in five seconds, you know, et cetera, et cetera, which was very true. 
So um, it was brought to my attention by a graduate student and by Lilia Rosas that this is something that needs to be preserved. I talked to people in uh, the IT thing who figured out a way to sort of like be able to transfer the recording from the digital media, from the real to real to digital media. And I used the word transfer on purpose because if we recorded it, it was a violation of intellectual property. It was mm -hmm. only meant to be distributed once and not heard again. So I, um, what we called it was transfer because these recordings were done in conjunction with graduate students and assigned people to spread the word about what was going on in um, Austin in the late 70s and early 80s. So the collect, the transfer, the original intent of the recordings was to um, spread the word about what was going on in Austin in the late 1970s, 1980s. So we were not violating copyright. We're still um, holding to the original intent of the recording back then. Um, I had to deal with an intellectual property lawyer. I had to deal with um, UT's branding. I had to interview everyone who'd been interviewed, who was still around, who was doing the interviews, to find out what the intent was. And those conversations with uh, John Wheat, with Andres Tijerina, those are all part of the, the, the website. And this website has, uh, we were able to transfer 281 shows that were done between 1970 and 1980 uh, done by uh, the first tenured uh, Latina faculty member at UT, done by Andres Tijerina, who was uh, integral into building the Mexican American collection here, with John Wheat, who is like probably has got some of the best radio voice around, who is just an archivist down here. Um, and it's kind of like a history as it happens point of view of what was going on in UT and in Austin in general from 76 to 1980. So I'm willing to bet that maybe you were also interviewed as Rasonida members in the 1970s, 1980s at that point in time. Um, and what's a value of it is that me and a graduate student, we annotated the interviews, we talked about the different things that were there so that historians can go in and try to do a history of uh, Austin in the 1970s before its current transformation. Um, and I think one of the things that's lost, I, I have an essay I want to write called Super Sounds of the 70s, is trying to get a sense of the texture and the voice and the conversations that people had, something that you can't get from reading a book. Mm. Because when I, you read words, you hear your mother speaking. I mean, I hear my mother speaking. <laughs> Why aren't you working harder? Um, <laughs> but <coughs> everyone fills in the voice. Is thinking about the texture of oral history um, and finding ways to transmit the texture as well as the actual words that people happen. So I think um, getting people who've done these stories, if you have the tapes of all the things, trying to get those annotated digitally and getting a method to that to try to capture some of that as well. Um, so I think for political engagement, it's really great to have the buttons at the meetings, but also oral history is a much better way to get a sense of the the ups and downs and the emotions and the engagement that the printed record will never give. So I think w when we think of uh, the record of engagement, trying to get the voices into digital media, trying to get them conserved, trying to annotate it would be incredibly valuable. And I think um, this has gone from historicizing Latino political activism to becoming uh, a call to get people to start uh, recording the conversations they're already having. Mm. Um, and the rooms that they're having. So right now, I guess there's a student uprisings, even here at UT. Um, we've been, I've been part of the movement of having undocumented workers change city policies since I've been here for, six, for the last eight years with a uh, workers' defense project. Um, there's been sort of like collective barrio accounting happening here in Austin. And I fear that, um, I think this is what my advisor said, like, when the revolution is happening, don't go into the archives. Mm. Interview people. And I think there's a new wave of revolution people moving on. So take the, those conversations, tape them, put them on Twitter. And we have new technology. We new all have our recording devices now. And don't take for granted who the leaders are mm. of the revolution. Um, when, like, as someone who does these things and reads these stories, people talk about, like, oh, pobrecitas las mujeres, we're taking notes we're cooking in the back, we're recording, we're writing the memos. I'm like, but then 
who tells the stories. It's the people writing the memos, putting together things, and that's the first draft of history before even journalists go. And sure, they were in front of the mic, but no one's really recording the mic. So you've got the pictures where the guys are there, and then the people who are doing the work, it's their work that's showing up on paper. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people have started to spin that around and talk about those pobrecitos who grab the mic and not the people who are actually doing the work. And I think that needs to be spun around again as, I guess, a second or third generation. Technically, I'm still part of the baby boom because I was born in 67. But the <laughs> post-baby boom uh, generation needs to be done. So I want to put that as a charge to think about political engagement um, for those of you who are hoping to be on this side of the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> and also Google Onda Latina um, to get a sense of what we did. Mm. Um, it uh, was beautifully done. It was a collective effort. Um, and I, hopefully books will be spawned by this process. Um, and since we have someone who's a historian of political engagement and someone who's, and people have been politically engaged right here, and I think we have this room till, um, tw well, I'd say 1145. Are there any questions that people have for Julie or questions for other panelists or methods that you can use to sort of like share their stories or archives where people can sort of like bring this process in? Um, I think it's a good time to chime in. Well, when you mentioned your wife, is she, is she an art professor? I'm just curious. Um, well, she's a professor in American Studies. And one of these things I was listening to, Ju That's fine, Julie. Professor yeah. Picior, um, talking about sort of like the interviewing people and talking to people about bringing the books down. I'm like, wow. So think of the stories you could tell about San Antonio from the point of view of the mutualistas using these um, uh, records. I could do that. Um, her, you can also Google her. She did 14 interviews with Tejano artists. So all of that stuff has been recorded. It's in the Smithsonian. Um, mm -hmm. It's a tool for research. And it also tells you, um, uh, Professor Pissu was talking how miserable Lulac was towards uh, Mexican immigrants. There's a story of... Um, Oh my God, he did the sidewalk um, down at the MAC. Uh, he has this great series of paintings oh, called yeah, Calzones. And the reason I say, because I'm married to an artist, Jose Trevino. Oh, okay. But I want you to know that back in the, in the 70s, we started a, a, a group called Mujeres Artistas del Sudoeste. Mm -hmm. And when I, was a, when I was a student at St. S. and Santa was a student at, here at UT, we decided that in order to move on to what direction we wanted to go in the area of art, we had a, 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 a Conferencia Plastica Chicana, which, as a matter of fact, the university is known as the art space. We brought in Raquel Tibol from Mexico, in Chile, Pepita, and Diego. We brought in Pedro Mejer, he just gotten back from filming the Nicaragua, well, photographing the Nicaraguan Award, a guy that deal with communication and filming. We brought in 20 students of UNAM and Adolfo Muchaco, mm. who was a student of Leopoldo Mendes, and he taught, he taught at UNAM. We brought in a lot of Tejano artists from all over the U.S., but since we only had money for the flights, we housed people in private homes. And that got the beauty and saying as long as there's space, because they knew this was going to be a historical event. It was like a three-day thing. And I still have the pamphlet with all the sessions that took place, mm. you know. But to me, and then plus, I also, in, in 1980, I did my first uh, exhibit that I curated. It was called the Plaza C here at the Student Union. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. It was awesome. And you, you know Jose Rivera, right, that does sculptures on the ski? A lot of his pieces were there at Marcha Gomez, and we had, of course, all the Tejano artists, San Martinez, Amado Peña. And that was the first time that this, the Daily Texas had only too much coverage in the... Anyway, and it was awesome. It was a great... That would, those were my <laughs> my stories that I've got to eventually turn them into. Mm -hmm. No, and and I think this is another point that when um, Latinos make it into public institutions that we paid for right. as taxpayers, right. as sales taxes, um, things open up and they're like, oh my God, we had no idea there were so many Latinos in Austin, or we had no idea there were so many Latinos in Los Angeles, or we had no idea we had so many things. And I think part of it is like reminding people like, this is the public, like, we pay you. Uh, th this is part of the community, and you want people in the museum. And when you do these things, people come. Well, even some Well, not to, when you involve people in the community, 
right. people come. Well, Santa Barraza taught at Chicago Institute in Pennsylvania. And now she's teaching at what I call the Unam of the Southwest. She's teaching in Kingsville, Texas A&M, because a lot of the top notch Chicano artists went to school there. And thanks to the new director, Hispanic director, that supports her. I mean, she's taken students to Munich, Germany, and from there they introduced her to a university in Austria. And two years ago, it was in Madrid, and they bought a lot of her pieces on paper. Mm -hmm. So like, if I mean, when I went to Spain, I I decolonized my spirit, like, oh, he's just like Because we had to hire teachers from Spain, and Spain thought that the was like, he thought that it was like, he And she would go there in court, she was a bilingual coordinator, so she'd go there. <laughs> so we have friends there, you know. But I mean, it's like what's happening here. I mean, they even had what I call the Global Wall Street, when I went to it in Portugal. And they told me we were in Madrid, you need to leave, and they had a strike here. And I couldn't help but think that that was part of the economy that we things are going. So anyway, that's just my learning experience, even as a person. Yeah. Anybody, students, want to talk? Yeah, rising scholars, go well, ahead. I, I, hear from the students. I was going to say that oral histories are, and I think I've realized in recent like experiences that I've had I'm doing a lot of interviews. I'm actually from San Antonio, from the west side, and I've been doing a case study on Linear High School. Uh, my dad was an alumni from there. And so I've been interviewing a lot of people who went to Lanier from the 40s, 60s to present. Um, and, you know, I, I think I'm very fortunate from San Antonio because there were a lot of activists mm -hmm. from the community um, that I've had to look up to and talk to about these, uh, the issues that we're facing our particular community. But, like, now that I'm in Austin, I find myself like, kind of, like, reaching out to other people and trying to see, like, this, what's the Austin experience mm. like? Because I'm very familiar with the San Antonio mm -hmm. experience. Um, so I've, you know, been talking to professors and kind of trying to find out, like, the dynamics of the city in Austin. Because when I first moved here in 2010, I was working at the Capitol, and I just felt so out of place in the city. <laughs> And so now, like I, I talk, and, I, and it, it's the the histories, the stories that you get so much more than just reading a book or reading an article about like what the city is like. I think actually having conversations with people, um, it just makes the story come alive, in my opinion. Especially with like more documentaries, and you know, I just saw Stolen Education by Dr. Aleman, and it was really, I think helpful to see their faces when they were talking about their experiences. It was about the Hernandez case um, in uh -huh. school. Um, and, and see their faces when they were speaking because you can see all the emotion that you don't necessarily get when you're reading text. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's a, an important aspect that, you know, like I said, makes the story come alive. And I think using that to kind of garner support and garner, you know, activism and people coming together to see like how far we've come and, and how much we fought to get where we are is going to only take us further. So that's just my little <laughs> aside. <laughs> it, it, it's interesting to see progress or, or look at progress from a, a timeless perspective, if you will. And I guess as you get older, you get less time oriented and you get more <laughs> philosophical. <laughs> But, but I think that what we're touching on right now, if you look at technology, how technology has changed the traditional way in which we mark down our histories, there's a new, there's an emergence of a new technology. Uh, uh, I worked with AT&T for a number of years promoting them, and uh, Ralph De La Vega, who's their CEO, talked about that what he wanted during his legacy as CEO and president of AT&T was to leave us with the concept of three screens. AT&T wanted to control the television <laughs> screen, the, the flat screen, if you will, the computer screen, and the smartphone screen. And if you look at oral history as a medium, and you take into effect what this young lady just said about seeing people telling their stories, I wrote a book because I wanted to educate people about the accomplishments and contributions of Latinos in the United States that goes overlooked in, in our educational system. Okay, we don't, all we know about ourselves is what people have told us. Okay, not what, yes, there's a lot that has been written, 
But there's a lot of people who don't read, okay? Don't have a need to read or don't have an interest in reading, okay? Yet they gain information. Our community, the Latino consumer market in the United States, we over-index in the use of smartphone technology, okay? Uh, we o we over-index in texting. We over-index on Facebook in sh sharing pictures of ourselves and, and our activities. Oral history could be looked at as a renaissance of sorts, mm -hmm. if you will, of how to communicate information about our communities because at every one of my book signings and, and, and speaking engagements, I talk about the fact that each of you, everybody in this audience, has a story to tell. Okay? But we don't know how to tell it. Or we don't feel that we're competent in English or, or in writing skills to actively or, or, or effectively tell our stories. But if you listen to what goes on during bachangas at your house, or baptisms, or funerals, or weddings, and you listen to all the interchange that goes on between the various people that are there, you learn things about your family, you learn things about your neighborhood, you learn things about your history that you didn't know before. Oh, my tia did that? Oh, my tio did that? Oh, my sobrino did this? How come you guys never told me? I'm telling you now, okay? And if you can capture those things with a phone, a video, Instagram, you know, it, it, it becomes part of that capturing those stories. And, and I think there's something for all of you who say, well, I don't have time to write a book, okay? It took me nine and a half years to write mine, okay? Then to get a publisher to buy it or to publish it was another two, three years. So you know, a lot of people don't have that time to invest, but they will, in a second, sit down and talk to you about their experiences and what they've done. And if we don't capture that stuff, shame on us because we're losing a tremendous amount of our history. Uh, I talk about in the book about historians have a tendency to capture through, the, through a river, they'll capture all the blood, the floating bodies, the damage and everything that's done in society <coughs> while on the shores on both sides of that river there are people who are living mm -hmm. who are quiddling things that are raising children that are growing crops mm -hmm. and historians very seldom cover what's going on in the shores of that river mm -hmm. because the blood and the bodies and all the damage and all the violence is what captures their attention mm -hmm. and i think that we need to get back to our social interests our, our personal interests, our familial interests, and capture more of the history uh, that occurs within our families and those perspectives, because that's what's missing in history that we're taught. Mm -hmm. And the sooner we do that, I think the more culturally advantaged we're going to become. I just want to uh, say real quickly, one example is the History Channel. It's a premier example of what you're talking about, right? It's all blood and stuff. Um, could you give us the title of your book? It's called The ABCs and Enye. Oh, yeah. Oh, ABCs and Enye. Okay, of yeah. America's Cultural Evolution. Okay, thank you. The, top, the subtitle is The Growing Influence of Hispanics, Latinos, and Mestizos in the USA. Okay. One of the other things, just to be able to play the moderator role, um, is as people are ensconced in universities, is um, oral history is an organizing tool. Because you interview someone, you ask them to share their story with you, then you ask, if hopefully you have a relationship with the archive, that it'll go somewhere, that it'll be stored, and then that person who isn't actually part of the institution, then will hopefully um, have the authority to be able to go in and knock on the scary, um, you know, walk past the big, ugly Omeka face, take a turn around and make their way into the bench and say, where is my story? And it, oral history can play a key role in democratizing 
and opening up the university mm. in ways that just asking for people's papers doesn't do. Mm. Um, because even if you get people's papers, if you do these things, it does that, I mean, it, um, it doesn't quite do the same, like it's just papers. There's not a story that's attached that gives a, a layer of meaning to the papers that is there. So I'd ask everyone who's here, who's it's gone to institution, to try to find ways to get those stories to be part of the institutions they are, to push places to have archives to record them. Um, and even in other places. So, so I don't know if people want to talk about their experiences interviewing people and then being responsible to the people that they've interviewed as well. Um, the, I think that it, this is important as a journalist, but also as a social, social scientist. I, I attended the um, presentation of the book, Invisible in Austin. I don't know if oh, you're yeah. familiar. It's a collection of ethnographies of uh, minorities, um, specifically 11 people in Austin. And so those uh, sociology graduate students did this very interesting work. I recommended it. Um, and the discussion about uh, the, the work behind it, it was uh, this struggle that the teacher had with the students, because it was uh, the, the professor that did the, uh, was the editor of the project, and the students were who actually did the number. And so they talk about how uh, the traditional way of doing ethnographies, which is very related to oral history, because you collect the, you interview, you follow people. Um, the traditional way of doing it is the ethnographer or the historian is who tells the story. So you collect it, collect it, and you, you tell the story. You are, in a, in a way, um, the mediator. And the students didn't want to follow that traditional way of doing it. They wanted to make the, the, the objects of the study, the people they were studying, also the uh, part of it. So they decided they were going to share drafts of their work and see what they had to say about it. And it's interesting um, because the both styles have different effects on the final product. Um, the more open one, the ones to the one that wants to be incl inclusive and responsible with the people you are uh, interviewing and, and doing ethnographies on, it's also a compromise because. Uh, from what I heard, the students were, in a way, the, the stories that they wanted to tell originally were, in a way, a little bit modified because they knew that the subjects were going to read and veto, if necessarily, the stories that they were going to tell were going to be told. So that I think it's an interesting process for academicians and, um, and final. Um, and, it, and it also it takes longer. Yes. Yeah. And in terms of the productivity academy, it takes longer to have sort of like a responsive, dynamic, accountable process. And I'm just going to say this, it's a real pity that the book people event where the uh, graduate students spoke, the people who were interviewed were actually in the audience, but didn't get a chance to speak about the process as well. And to me, that's like emblematic of how universities go like, look at how great we are. We had this really dynamic, reciprocal relationship, but we're not actually gonna have the people at this gracial, dynamic, uh, reciprocal relationship actually talk about being invisible in Austin. It's a wonderful piece. It's a taxi driver and a refugee, uh, a student, uh, a woman who works, who started her own started her own cooperative, uh, cleaning houses. Um, so it's really people who are invisible in Austin. but then they were invisible in the presentation of the book. I'm like, come on, people. Um, we're all part of a community, and we should all participate. I went participate. to a different presentation. Okay. It was here in, in the university. It was different, a different type, but I didn't know about that. Yeah. They have a website also, if you want to look it up. Just Google Invisible Announcement. Oh, it's 11.45, almost 11.45. Are there any questions for someone who's actually helped shape 
uh, the history of Mexican American political engagement, or actually at one point wrote the book on Mexican American political engagement, um, on sort of like maybe how did oral, how do oral history shape your understanding of Mexican American political engagement? Well, actually, that's really sweet of you to ask. I'm going to duck it. I'm just going to say, do you have other questions, comments, you know, people on any angle? Me? Anybody else? Uh, okay, I'm sorry. I don't know if you remember the question. How did oral histories change your understanding of Mexican American political engagement? Wow. Um, um, that's so basic. I, I'm going to have to think about that. Um, I think part of what you were saying, John, the um, qualitative, the human this, the, the sense of community um, more. Uh, why we go into it in the beginning is because we're because of we're people and we want people to be honored. So I think it reminds us. I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of intellectual mm -hmm. reasons, but my gut reaction is that. Um, yeah. Pues muchísimas gracias por venir esta mañana. Ya sé que muchos están trabajando y muchos ya no están trabajando, pero siguen en la lucha. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, I know you're all very busy and have other wonderful things to do, but I hope you shared a wonderful 90 minutes with Professor Picior and the other people here in the audience. And if you could please give uh, Julie a hand, that would be really nice. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I, I'd be happy to sign my book out there. There's a bunches of them out there. At least there were. And a continuación.